1957, the bomb dropped. Las Vegas became the last free state. And one guitar-picking, sword-swinging wanderer is fighting for the throne. And one lone orphan is along for the ride. He scratched my guitar. They called him the Six String Samurai, and he became a legend. Six String Samurai. We've come out of the Korean Spaghetti Western. Uh, where are you taking me to? I am taking you to a different type of sort of Western called Six String Samurai. Yeah. I saw this film shortly after it came out in the late 90s. I had completely forgotten about it. It got me someone I know mentioned it on Facebook and I went, oh my god, this movie would be absolutely perfect for rare delicacies. <laughs> in the late 50s, there was a nuclear war featuring Russia and the United States. Okay. Russia won. All right. The only free city left in America is Las Vegas. Makes sense. The ruler of Las Vegas is Elvis Presley. He is the king, of course. <laughs> Elvis has died, and Vegas needs a new king. Power vacuum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This movie is bonkers. It's 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 all metaphor. It's all batch insane. <laughs> <laughs> this is truly one that I've never even heard of. I mean, the title alone tells me. I mean, the Six Green Samurai. You can tell me that. That title, and I would assume it's it's just about a wandering musician because you know six string implies guitar, and a samurai implies someone who's really skilled with said guitar. Uh, that's the best I can do. But if you're telling me that it involves this alternate parallel universe where Elvis is the king of the last free city in America, which, given the fact that one of my favorite movies involving Elvis involves him in a black JFK fighting a mummy, this is uh, it, it, this is entirely up my alley. Oh yeah, I, I really think you'll enjoy this. Uh, okay, for those of you who are looking for it, I found it in two places. Nobody streams it. Nobody. Uh, my, my personal local library had one copy. Wow. <laughs> I all, but there is a company called Vinegar Syndrome, which I just discovered. Oh, yeah, Vinegar Syndrome is great. They will be having it again. I, mm -hmm. other than that, this is impossible to find. Wow. Well, you know, bless you, Vinegar Syndrome. I mean, you've done some incredible work restoring some very obscure films that do deserve the, the limelight. If doing this episode means bringing this one an audience, hopefully right at the right time, at the right time when Vinegar Syndrome's bringing it out. I'm all for doing this, so. Yeah. The director's name is Lance Mungia. Yeah, and he's also done, he did One of the Crows. Oh, God. Not the, one, that against him. Not the one with Edward Furlong, is it? Sometimes, the crow can bring that soul back to put the wrong things right. Uh, yeah, he's not known for much. Mm. Uh, the, the crow, Wicked Player. Yeah, the one with Edward Furlong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Hey, that's fine. Sometimes you get one gig because you did good with another gig. I'm also trying to figure out how I... How it got on my radar. I want to say Ebert reviewed it and loved it. Really? But I could not find the review. Huh. Um, so how this... Uh, I remember watching it. I remember loving it. I remember watching it on DVD. I had not seen it in the theaters. But why I... It might have been just a, I saw it and went, all right, what the hell? But I, that, I, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got nothing. Yeah. I mean, you, your knowledge of it is, far, it is more than mine, so I'm, I'm at your mercy this time. So. Okay. So I guess uh, this is uh, Six Dream Samurai. Hoorah. <laughs> So anyway, there was something I forgot to say. Mm -hmm. That this movie was basically Mad Max meets Boy and His Dog meets Carl Jung. Okay, but there was a lot of Boy and His Dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, in when we were, I was going through this, and I was just like going... I don't know why. I mean, there's no... 
psychic bond between the two of them, but there was, I was definitely getting some serious boy and his dog vibes. Maybe not so much between the central characters, but more just the world. Yeah. Because the world of a boy and his dog was extremely eccentric. And I, I feel like this is kind of like, you could imagine all, all of this taking place in the same kind of world. One of my greatest, saddest, you know, lamentations is the fact that Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino's Grindhouse did not become the juggernaut that, frankly, in my opinion, it should have been. Uh, because I would have loved to have seen more collaborations with all the other, like, kind of renegade filmmakers around that time. This is, frankly, what I think it would have looked like if Peter Jackson had joined the fray. Okay. <laughs> because, honestly, this is this has a lot of echoes of what would happen if Peter Jackson, and I'm talking uh, Bad Taste uh, and Brain Dead, uh, Peter Jackson teamed up with Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino. That is what this movie looks like to me. I mean, this movie came out in 1998. So I, I, I have a feeling this one really was way ahead of the Grindhouse Nouveau movement, which frankly I think is really starting to come into prominence in recent years. Uh, but I feel like it came out way too early. Yeah. I would definitely say that was the major reason why I think only now Vinegar Syndrome is like resurrecting it. I think if this movie had come out now, especially with viral marketing, with uh, YouTube the way it is, I think this would have freaking, this would have taken over. You can tell it's all very thinly veiled uh, satirical commentary about, you know, the the passing of the guard or, or the, you know, the old rock and roll with, of course, the new, you know, God, the death metal and all that stuff. That's like going, you don't give a damn if there's any subtlety whatsoever to your argument here. You just want to... You just want to have a wicked looking villain and of course death metal versus old school 50s rock and roll yeah. is the way to go. This is a movie that does not give anything resembling a fuck as far as whether or not it makes sense it or whether or not it's meant to say anything profound. It doesn't care. Everything, probably everything in there is a metaphor. Oh, you can it's eat. Gotta be. It's oh. got to be. <laughs> oh, no, everything is obviously derivative of some kind of, you know, with some kind of uh, subtext. But but in the end, I'm still looking at all this, just going, you just want to make some rock and roll themed post-apocalyptic extravaganza with a little bit of heart, tiger and his cub. Yeah. Type scenario with a little, with a little soup song of, um, of Kurosawa in there. I was saying when we were watching it, I said, I, I honestly have no clue how this movie got funded in the first place. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it, but uh, I don't know how you pitch this. I don't know how you convince anybody without m major drugs <laughs> that this is that this is going to sell because unfortunately it didn't. You see, it's it's easy to default and assume drugs have anything to do with it. I'm actually going to be a bit more optimistic and just assume that the filmmaker just had all these things he loved and he just wanted to have one movie that featured it all. It's clear that he loved rock and roll. It's clear that he may have loved like post apocalyptics like, you know, Mad Max and the like. And it's very clear that he must love the, the films, love Kurosawa, very obviously. And it's just clear he wanted to make a movie that just encompassed all those things he loved. No, I'm okay with that. Yeah. What I mean is... He had to get somebody to fund this. Oh, as far as, <laughs> oh, as, far as like getting the funding, um... I can imagine with the budget on this, because of course there's no names. The only name in this movie, funny enough, that actually went on to do like great things was the composer, Brian Tyler. Yeah. Uh, about a couple years after this, he would do the incredible score for Boba Hotep, and then he would actually go on to do scores for the MCU, uh, where he would actually wind up doing scores for Iron Man 3, and he would contribute to the score for uh, Age of Ultron. Jeffrey Falcon, who played uh, Buddy, or Four Eyes, as everyone keeps calling him. What? What? I mean, his dialogue is very overdubbed, but I didn't know if it was because he actually didn't speak a word of English or something, or... I don't know, but there's something that added to the charm of the film as a whole, that a majority of his dialogue was very, very obviously dubbed. Yeah, uh, and now that you've mentioned it. Well, and it's also interesting because none of the actors, none of the actors I've seen in any... I, I looked him up, it's mm -hmm. like... After the movie, there's eight nothing. Other, there's eight other movies, but I've never heard of any one of them. Yeah, and they all came before this one, and then this movie, and then nothing. Yeah. After that. 
Oh um, yeah. Um, well, actually, another one that this kind of reminds me of it actually has a bit of echoes of uh, Hell Comes to Frog Town. It definitely reminds me a lot. Of, it has some. Okay. Yeah. One bit of research I found out is that the kid could only film on the weekend. So apparently, this movie took a long time to <laughs> film. <laughs> And I feel bad because the majority of this movie is outdoors in the desert, and you can even see that kid getting crispy by the end, you know, just getting nice and sunburned. So I can only imagine how long it must have taken to actually really. And unfortunately, they could they this kid's in practically every single yeah. scene in the movies, which means that this movie must have taken an eternity to film. Yeah, it really must have. Yeah. Well, it's like why didn't you just wait for summer vacation, dude? Because that's why, because the kid had school, so they were like, why didn't you just wait for summer vacation? Tell the kid, you know, you do well in school, you won't have to go to summer school, and then, you know, you can yeah. film this movie all summer. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I, <laughs> it's been released, but this particular month they're doing some weird thing, and you can't buy it right now. Oh, but you will, inevitably, I'm sure. Yeah, on next month. Yeah. No, on that's fine. July 1st, it'll be available again. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. That, there you go, then. So, yeah, I, str I strongly <laughs> recommend it. I uh, love it as much as I did the first time around. I will say it was a lot more batshit insane than I thought it was the last <laughs> time around, and that's saying something. <laughs> it didn't get strange enough that they're being stalked by... Um, the literal personification, the little of, personification death. of death. The well, I will say there were some really cool shots that they did with death. I mean, there's a really cool one like from the sh where he backs into the shadows and just like as the last as the last like vestige of him all of a sudden like his white skull face yeah. shows up and i was like that's pretty cool so they did some good stuff visually with him uh and uh then if that's not enough you throw in a whole cadre of russians yeah so then... he's the entire russian army <laughs> Yeah, oh, jeez. And then, and, and amidst all that, ironically, every time he gets wounded, it's because the kid distracted him. And it's like, God damn it, kid, just shut up. <laughs> what, kid? <laughs> You're worse than the kid from the Babadook, jeez. And he almost never talks. Yeah, and except until like one random moment when he all of a sudden starts says, talking about. Talking about how one how how one car is better than the other, and even he's like, now you choose to talk, yeah. and this is what you're choosing to talk about. Well, apparently, he always knew he just didn't want it. I guess so. I guess so. Oh, um, by the way, the kid's name is David. It, the was it is not mentioned very brief. The mother says David. Oh, okay. It's one of those things where you just kind of don't really need it. You know, it's is it really? What's in the name? What's in the name? Oh, uh, it just hit me. Spoiler. King David. Oh, so they went biblical on this. <laughs> Why? Because they could. Because they could? Okay. Yeah, that, that really explains a whole lot of this movie. Because they could. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. But, I mean, if you're going to throw a biblical allegory, I mean, at this point, you, you know, I would just laugh if he arrives in Vegas and all of a sudden everyone's starting to do the BIM. And then we find out this whole time this whole well, thing's in the same, the same universe as the Apple. And, and well, and another one. Uh, Vegas was every every building was silver. Mm -hmm. The Silver City, heaven. Oh, Jesus. Okay, that's it. I'm putting it down. This movie's in the same universe as the Apple. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, like at the second, you know, little David shows up, all of a sudden you say, "Attention, attention." Minute to four o'clock. Time to stop ordinary activities and prepare for the national BIM hour. No year will go by that I will not make a reference to the apple. Well, I suppose that would also explain how this kid is able to kill death with a bottle of water. Yeah. I suppose, but... you think well, it, again, I still think it's holy water. Well, now it is, especially when you put that in there. <laughs> because I guess when we were initially watching it, the kid like just sprays it with water, and I was like going... What was it, Dasani? I mean, I guess I would do it. 
Well, well first you spit on them. Oh, you spit on Well, then that's then it's definitely Dasani. And bottom line is, it's batshit insane. Everything's a metaphor. Just enjoy the ride. Oh, this is totally a just take the ride kind of movie. You don't... You don't need to be thinking of the layers or the depths on this one, and you don't need to, because frankly, everything on the surface of this movie is so freaking interesting anyway, and it's so hilarious and so bonk and just so delightfully bonkers. You're not gonna give a shit. I, I would love to see someone cosplaying as Buddy. Don't tempt me. No, okay. <laughs> don't tempt me. Dragon Con is back, baby, and Spooky Empire is coming around in October. I'm, I will wear. I will try it just to test the water to see who's gonna get it. Because two percent of cosplay is my jam. That is such my jam. Comment section: Do you want me to cosplay as Buddy? Because I might do it. I'm putting this. I'm putting this one on the menu, kind of in the same world as Phantom of the Paradise. Uh, it, it, it really yeah. is. Yeah, just because. Well, they're both commentaries on music. Oh yeah, absolutely. You got the commentaries on music, but even then, they all take place in this crazy heightened reality. That it's it, if if you don't get the subtext, you're not lost. The movie will still be entertaining because it's doing something so much that's so interesting on its own terms, regardless of looking under the hood and figuring out how it works. But suffice to say, if you did have to rack your brain, then all you need is a ratchet, apparently. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ratchets are... Ratchets are like sonic screwdrivers in this world. Aha! Ratchet. I wonder where I could trade the kid for a ratchet. And, and honestly, I was kind of hoping at the tail end when Buddy was dead, like all of a sudden, you know, D little David found a ratchet and just resurrected him, and then there you go. I tend to think of it like an RPG. Maybe. You know, Fallout. So, well, actually, there's yeah. even a town named Fallout. So, you know, they use the magic. And yeah, there you go. You're good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you know what? In the Mad Max, uh, in, the, in the Mad Max uh, video game that came out on the PS4, uh, your little hunchback buddy chum, you know, black finger chum bucket, uh, whenever you need to fix the car, you just tell him fix the car, and all he's got is just his tools, and that's enough to fix the horrific damage that your car... <laughs> you know, this is, this is a video game world. I've never played Fallout my own self, but I've told, that I've seen, like, it's got some wacky elements to it. I can picture this being in the Fallout universe. Oh, yeah. This is a party movie. Yeah, and it's a movie you want to show... It's a movie you want to show your friends and say... Here's a movie you've never heard of before. Here's a movie you've never seen before. Enjoy. And yeah. honestly, given the fact that now it's, it's, oh God, it's actually, yeah, it's a little more than 30 years old now. You're going to lament that you never knew this movie existed until now. I'm actually really glad that, you know, we're going to be doing our part to try to get people to make, to make this one aware. So just on principle, this one is truly on, on the menu. menu.